lift our hands and begin to praise and magnify God. He's a great God and he's to be praised. Amen. Father God, we praise you, we magnify you, we glorify you, and we edify you. There is none like you in all the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, bless your holy name. Hallelujah. You are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. And your mercy endures forever.
Righteous, 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 
the Lord. We honor you, Lord. We love you, Lord. You are worthy to be praised. There is none like you. We rejoice that you are on the throne. We rejoice in knowing our hope is in you. We rejoice knowing that our life is in you. We stand firm on the foundation of Christ. That is the foundation we stand on. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved, but we continually celebrate our life in Christ. We thank you, Lord, you are good. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. You know, there's a mighty thing about praise and worship. I was talking to some friends again recently, and uh, we said how important it is to show up on time for church. And I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody at all. But what I'm saying is this. What praise and worship does for the believer to prepare their heart for the service is vital. The Word of God declares that God inhabits the praises of His people. The Word of God also declares that we are to enter His gates with thanksgiving, enter His courts with praise. See, there's, there's a, multi, there, there's a multi-layer thing that happens when you come expecting in praise and worship. See, praise and worship puts an anointing on the minister. It equips, the presence of God becomes like in a saturated form. I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this. I'm not just playing. It becomes in a way because the goals of the minister is to relay a message from the throne because one word of that message may change your life forever. May be, it may be something you've been hanging on You've been believing God for some revelation. And that word will establish that. Now listen, that's great, but now for you. Coming in, lifting your hands, praising God. What it does, it puts you in focus to be able to receive that word. See, there's some, I mean, we should make sure that we don't only show up, but we enter in. Because when we do, it prepares your heart and it prepares the minister heart, minister's heart to receive exactly the word that will be planted in your heart that will not return void, amen? I'm telling you what, there may be something that God, it may be something different even that I'm speaking, but because there's an anointing on it, it will open up something. You ever been believing God for something and the minister's even talking something else, but it opens up that door in your heart for you to say, Now I got it. Now I know how to approach a situation with my child that'll save their life. You see what I mean? It's not by accident. It's by God knows what he, God knows what's needed. See, there's something he may want to deliver to you that you can't handle yet. But when you enter in, he will set you up to be able to open that specific thing for you 
that will be able to minister life for you. Not only life for you, but hey, when you get life in you, it becomes contagious for other people. Amen. Amen. God, God knows what he's doing. Amen. I'm sticking with him. How about you? He's so good. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We love you. Our hearts are open to receive the words you have for us today. Lord, we thank you that we are prepared. We are ready. Holy Spirit, have your way in this service. Lord, we thank you. You never leave us nor forsake us, but we thank you. There is, an, there is a presence and an anointing that can take place that will change lives, that will restore marriages, that will, that will mend broken hearts, that will establish your plan and your purpose today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Well, we are happy to be able to say our pastors are, uh, was able to get away for a few days to just rest and relax, amen, and we can still have church. Isn't that good? Praise God. We love our pastors. We thank the Lord for our pastors. We thank the Lord that they're able to get away and uh, just celebrate and, you know, have a good time together and just relax and um, get prepared for what God has for them. God is so good. Now, um, I'm the children's minister. If you don't know me, I'm not the pastor. I'm the children's pastor here. So if you don't like the message today, come back next week, okay? It'll be better. If you do love the message, it gets better, okay, next week. So, so, we're so I'm so honored to be able to minister. We're going to minister here in a few minutes. God is so good. But thank the Lord for our pastors, amen? You know, when you look in the Word of God, you see that there's a, on, there's a blessing on our ministers. And you know another thing, if you believe you're called to be here, in this house of worship, you, you, you believe you're called to be here, then pray for your pastors. Pray for them. Believe God. You know, the Bible talks about a double blessing on our, on our ministers. Amen. And, and God wants to, when you pray for them, you open your heart towards them. And, and I really believe this, and I preached about this many times, but I'll just say it again, that the Bible says wherever your heart is, your treasure will be there also. And now, a lot of people have always taken that as, you know, you kind of just well, whatever happens, my heart's there, that's where I'm at. No, I take it as a proactive statement. Wherever you put your treasure, your heart will follow. So when you put your time, your effort, your talents, your resources in this church, it's amazing your heart will be in this church. Okay? If you just become a spectator and just show up once in a while, then it's going to be hard for your heart to be involved. But when you get involved with your time, your money, your efforts, your talents, your resources, it's amazing that your heart's there, that nobody talks about your pastor, that you want to make sure that you're praying over your church. You see what I mean? It, your heart changed. It's kind of like I always say, one of the greatest ways to, to solve a marriage issue, and I, and I talk to men all the time, and I'll just take a little quick side journey. I, I talk, we have a manhood stuff. We talk to men a lot of times. I say, one of the greatest ways not, not to say is, oh, my heart's not in it anymore. I said, begin putting your time, your efforts, your resources, your talents, and your, your abilities, and it's amazing your heart will stay there. Amen. Whatever it is, you put that effort there, your heart shows up on the scene. Your heart shows up and your heart stays there. When you put your treasure there, that's where your heart will be also. Amen. Praise God. Well, we are going to, in just a few minutes, um, we'll talk about giving our tithes and offering. Now, what we'll do is, at the, if you need an offering envelope, we have ushers that will hand those to you. But at the end of service, we have a different offering deposit boxes or whatever you want to call it uh, on the walls and stuff you'll you'll see them and everything like that and you can just put that in those boxes but praise god god is good god is faithful i know some people have talked to me and said these meetings you guys had last week was died on my they were awesome amen they were good people got encouraged stirred up and that's what they're for amen to encourage you and stir you up you know i got good news for you god's still on the throne that ought to make somebody happy. I'll say it to this side of the room. You guys might be, my, my 830 group hollered louder than that. God's still on the throne, amen? God's still on the throne. We rejoice and celebrate. Nothing has changed to a believer. God's still on the throne. The word of God is still true. God's still watching over his word to perform it in your life, amen? Now, you may have joined us uh, about three or four weeks ago, I, I think it was. We had a children's um, kids day service in there. And so I want to tell you good news. I won't be picking on anybody today. Nobody will have to show off their dance moves. Thank the Lord, you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, nobody will have to show off any of that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to, 
I can actually get serious a little bit too, believe it or not. Now, my wife may think something else, but I, I can get serious once in a while. No, but praise God. Um, let's go ahead, though. We're going to pray over our offering. And like I said, though, at the end of service, there's different boxes you can drop that offering into. Let's go ahead and pray over our offering. Father God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you that we're in covenant relationship with you. We thank you. You are so good. It is an honor to give, Lord. We thank you that when we give, Lord, we line up to your system, your way of doing things. Lord, and we thank you that you declared in your word that you will, you will bless us more and more, us and our children. So we stand on that. We believe we receive it by faith and we sow into the kingdom. We love you. We praise you. We call things paid off. We call favor. We call promotions in the name of Jesus. We call that we are major blessings to this world so people can really see who you are. We love you and we praise you in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Well, God is good. You know, I am excited to, uh, to minister today and I got a couple notes and all more amens, the quicker I preach and we can be the lunch. Amen. No, I, I tell you what. So don't just be amen to me all like crazy. Okay. You know, I mean, make sure, make a count, make a count. No, praise God. But we are so excited to be able to minister today, and we had a good 8.30 service, and we are excited. You know, I was talking about, unless, you're, unless you've been hiding for the last three or four months, there's some, there's some things going on in our world, amen? But you know what? I said, some, as believers, we have to be, we have to be careful, and I'll, and I'll explain why real quick, and then we're going to get into the message, but I believe this is a correct word to, to speak right now. Believers can tend to do a couple things. We can, number one, we can line up with everybody else and be afraid of everything, okay? I, I, I said what you'll see is un, when we're unrenewed in some areas, we'll become afraid of everything. Or believers, now listen to this, or believers can do the opposite and be mad and angry and want to tell everybody off on everything. Okay, what I want to say is this, neither, neither is healthy, okay? Neither is healthy. You don't win anybody here, and, we're, and everybody wants to judge everybody's faith, but nobody knows where everybody, anybody's faith at, okay? So be real careful there. But over here, fear is not... Remember this. Fear is the manifest of presence of the enemy. Faith is the manifest of presence of Jesus. See, everything the enemy does is a counterfeit version of what Christ does. Christ manifests his... Oh, this is so good. Christ manifests his will through faith. I like what some one minister said, faith is the hand that reaches out and grabs things in the heavenly and brings them to reality. You understand what I'm saying? That's faith. Now understand, the enemy has a version called fear. That's his way, that's his method of operating. See, he will make you afraid and that's his manifested presence in a situation. That's why we must stay in faith in anything. See, and the word of God is true, but here's where we miss it at. Here's where we miss it at. We try to express that in a wrong way by being mad at everything. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm pre I can look in the mirror right now and preach this sermon. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, I know you all are more spiritual than me, but that's where I've been in, in some areas where I'm fired up about everything. And then God showed me last week a scripture, and I want everybody real quick to turn to 2 Timothy. And I think this is important for everybody to feast their eyes on. 2 Timothy 2. Now look at this in 2 Timothy 2. I think this is going to be important for everybody to briefly. Because how many know, I don't know about you, but we're not judges. We've been called to a different thing. Now look at this, look at this. Let me get here real quick. We're looking at 2 Timothy. I had to get a new Bible not too long ago. Man, my pages stick together. It's a, ooh. You ever had, you know, a good Bible you don't want to give up, and sometimes you just have to move on. But listen to this. We're going to go to 2 Timothy 2. Now listen to this, verse 22. This will help somebody. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now listen to this. Don't have any, ooh, this is good. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant, that's us, must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. That word got me, everyone. You know what that means? Everyone. 
We can't select who we're kind to or not, Deborah. This is, well, we're going to have to talk later. Oh, oh, I mean, it says kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents, means people you don't agree with, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. That's what we are called to do as a believer. We are called to that. Because when you're, look, let me tell you something. Faith doesn't put pressure on people. Faith doesn't put pressure on people. Faith does not put pressure on people. Because if you're trusting God, you're in peace. Peace doesn't put pressure. So we're called, we're called. Yeah, we may disagree, but we're called to disagree in love. We're called to do it in love because I'm telling you what, I don't know about you, but my, my success plan for telling somebody off, ripping them up and down, is not good. They don't usually say, you were so right, brother, now minister to me. <laughs> but when I'm in love, it's amazing. The Bible talks about how gracious words are like honeycomb. It nourishes them. You know what? Gracious words will nourish somebody. Amen. And when you nourish somebody, guess what? They keep coming back. Yes. You know what I mean? When you're taking care of them, they keep coming back. That's what we're called to be. It's so funny. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, man, I told this story this morning, and I got to tell it again. It, it's so funny. We were uh, talking about learning and growing, and when you see something like that, you got to make some changes. Deborah and I was laughing about this after service, too. My, um, we were driving home, my son Carter, who's 14, was, I think, sitting in the back seat, and, and, um, or he was in the front, whatever, and Grace, yeah, Grace was in the back, my daughter, and she started hiccuping. I don't know what it is, but she wouldn't stop. It was like, good Lord, stop. You know what I mean? It was like, uh, uh, uh. It was like hiccups are annoying, except if they're from me, you know what I mean? Everybody else is like, ah. Uh. So she kept doing it, and she kept doing it, and I finally went, Grace, get some water, when we're driving down the road. Uh, you know, Carter goes, Looked at me and goes, no, no, dad. That's not how we handle it, dad. It's not how we handle it. You just need to say, hey, Grace, get some water when you get home. I went, <sighs> you know what I mean? It was like, I can't say, I was like, okay, Gracie, get some water when you get home. He goes, that's a good job, dad. That's all you had to say, bud. I'm like, man, my 14-year-old's teaching me. You know what I mean? But I said, man, you really are growing. But I thought, so I, he said that, and Grace and I just put our hands up. We got, we got laughing. He said, you're right, Carter. He said, that's all you had to do right there, Dad. That's all you had to say. We're learning, amen. But you know what I want to talk about today? I want to talk about the righteous life. You know, when we hear the word righteousness, we hear the word righteous. It's so powerful and so effective. And when you see, especially, it's all over the Bible, but when you look in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, you see over and over again benefits of living a righteous life. And so many times we get confused with the word righteous or righteousness because we think only that it's a position God has placed us in. He has placed, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are in a position. Now listen, that is true, and that, but that's not all that's to it. We are in a position of righteousness. When we receive Christ in our life, we are in a position of righteousness. However, please understand that it's not only a position we're in, it's a daily walk we're called to live. Okay? We are in a position of righteousness. And this is very important because when we look, we begin looking at the benefits of a righteous life. We know it's not only a position, praise God, we're in, but it's a reality of what we walk in as well. And Sid, I'm going to go through this real quick until we get to the meat of this, but, but just check this out. You see, like in 1 John 2, 29, it says, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Then we see, like, in, um, let's look at real quick. We'll, we'll jump down. Proverbs 21, three, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. See, I love this. It's, it's basically saying, you know, you can do a nice act or an important act and that's important, but it's more important to live a daily walk, to live that daily righteous life with Christ is what's more important to say. Now, now check this out. We'll get somewhere here. Proverbs 13, six, it says, righteousness guards the person of integrity righteousness guards. See, if righteousness is to guard me, then it's more than just a position I'm in. 
Praise God, I am in the position of righteousness. I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You and I can, when we receive Christ, can now come boldly before the throne. We have been made righteous because when he looks at us, he sees us through the eyes of Jesus. We've been made righteous. We can come to our Father. We can come, the Bible says, we can come boldly to our Father. Amen? We've been made righteous, not because of my works, not because of how great you are. It's because of how good Jesus was when he hung on that cross. And when I received that free gift, I've been made righteous. Amen. But it's also a daily continued walk we're supposed to walk in. Because when we walk in that righteousness that we've been equipped and graced to walk in, you see that, that we are guarded. We are protected through that. Now check this out. Also says in, we said Proverbs 13, 6, righteous guards the person of integrity. And then Psalms 34, 15 says this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Now I see this, I'm in a position, but also it's the daily walk. And when I walk that daily walk, I see that I'm guarded. I see that I'm protected. I see that I'm anointed. I see that I'm equipped. I also see that the eyes of the Lord are on me watching me. There's my boy. There's my boy. I'm going to take care of him. There's my boy. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm walking in that. I'm not only, it's not only a position. Now, now check this out. We're going to get somewhere. It's a walk. It's a daily walk. It's a daily lifestyle I live. Now check this out. This is one of my favorite. You guys been in any of the manhood stuff. You, lo you know this verse. Proverbs 20, verse 7. Whew, this is, I love this one. The righteous lead blame blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. See, when I, not only I'm in that position of righteousness, but when I, oh, this is so good, somebody get a hold of this. When I walk in the realities of my relationship with my Savior, when I walk in that righteousness that I've been given, when I walk in that, I walk in integrity, I walk in honesty, and when I walk in that, now listen to this, when I daily live a lifestyle of that, He doesn't only take care of me as He said He would, but He also blesses my children on behalf of me. That's powerful, brother. See, I love saying this all the time. It ain't just about you. It's not just about you. But when you do what's right, when nobody's watching, when you live that lifestyle, when nobody's looking at you, he's not only taking care of you, but he's setting your children up to be blessed. How could you not walk in that way? How could you not? But I don't see it. You don't know my kid. Keep walking in that righteousness he's given you. Because there is a covenant promise from my king that when I do, he said, my children will be blessed on behalf of the life I live. Amen. That's powerful. We're talking about righteousness. We're talking about a daily walk we live. And of course, we know Matthew 6, 33. It says, but seek first. See, it's given us a goal. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And I like saying it this way. He takes care of everything else. Amen. Now, here's what I want you to do. You say this righteousness is great. Living in this righteousness, we know we've been seated. But what, what, what does it look like? I, I guess that's the best way to say What does it look like to walk in this righteousness you talked about? I'm glad you asked. What I want to do today is talk about. Now, I've preached this before, and this is, fab, this is uh, needs to look at in the Word of God. A Romans 12 Christian. But I want to talk about today a Colossians 3 Christian. So if you would with me, turn to Colossians 3. We're going to read this and we're going to break this down. And I'm going to show you a great example of walking in this righteousness. Again, it's a place. It's a place we've been given. It's a place we didn't deserve. But when we call on the name of the Lord, we are seated and we are the righteousness of God in Christ. But it's also a lifestyle that we are expected to live. Amen. It is a lifestyle that we have been called to live. Now let's look at this. I'm going to read this pretty quick. I'm reading out the NIV today, so I'm going to read this pretty quick. Um, stay tuned here and we're going to get somewhere. Ver we're going to start with verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also then you will also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, 
But now, I love that, but now, come on somebody, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self. Now we're going to come back to that. Since you have taken off your old self with his practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all, amen. Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Listen to this, as God's chosen people, uh, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Don't ever say you can't forgive. Don't ever, it's, you, you can't, you, no, 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 you can't say that. He forgave your crazy self. You know what I'm saying? Don't ever say you can't forgive. And over all these virtues, over all of them, put on love. Now think about that again. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish with one another in all wisdom with, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, and whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and Father through Him. Now listen to this. All the husbands in just a moment should say amen. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Wives, you should be saying amen louder here in just a minute. Husbands, love your wives. Amen. Parents, you ought to say amen right here. Children, obey your parents. Amen. Kids, now it's your turn to say amen if we have any youth kids in here. Fathers, do not embitter your children. Amen. All right, I heard, some, I heard a kid somewhere. All right, all right. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. I like saying it this way. Employees, obey your earthly masters and everything and do it not only with their eyes is on you, this is so good, and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters, since you, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Now listen to this. You say, boy, you just read a lot. What's going on here? I'm telling you what, I just broke down to you. We're going to break this down in just a moment. I just broke down to you the lifestyle, the righteous life that you have been equipped and called to walk in. I said this earlier, and I'll say it again. Don't you ever let come out of your mouth. Boy, I wish I lived in another time. I wish I lived in the 20s. I looked great. That dancing was great in the 20s. I wish I lived in the 18s. I wish I was a cowboy. I wish I should have been a cowboy. You know what I'm talking about? I wish I was this or that. I wish I was this. I wish I wasn't here. I, I wish I was born 20 years ago. Boy, the 80s were so much better. Oh, the early 90s were the best. I'm going to tell you something. Stop. 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 Yeah, you maybe enjoyed a time then, or you enjoyed a certain, but let me tell you something. Every single one of you are called for this time, are called for this place. God has anointed you. He has equipped you for now. Now is the time. Now is the place. He's called you. He needs you here right now. Quit wishing about this time. Quit wanting about this time. Quit longing about this time. And let me tell you something. This is the time. This is the place for what God has called you to do. Amen. And when you become God-minded, you'll quit looking at what happened and start looking at what's ahead because there's a glory, pr glorious promise. He has promised for every single believer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Amen. This is the time for you. Amen? Amen? This is the time. So when we look at Colossians 3, when we look at this, it breaks it down so nice. And we're going to break this down real briefly and just for just a few minutes, we're going to break this down. But you look at the beginning of this. When you look through verses one through four, you see something. You see, it's time for all of us to become truly God-minded in our life. Yes. 
Let me tell you something. You're become, right now, if you're not God-minded, the Bible says in Romans that be, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Basically, it's saying you want to be renewed. You want to act different, talk different, think different. You must renew your mind with the Word of God. See, we have a lot of believers walking around in constant fear, like I told earlier, because they have an unrenewed mind when it comes to that. And the Word of God says it's time for us, when we look in Colossians, the beginning of that, it says it's time for us to get serious. Now listen to what the Message Bible says. This is that, that very beginning. This is so good. It says this. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Boy, this helped. This will help somebody today, guys. I'm telling you why. We're living in constant frustration right now because we're only focused on what's right in front of us. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. Be careful. I'm not judging you. You do you, you judge you. Yeah. But I'm telling you, be real careful right now and just focusing on what's right in front of you. Because when I did that, I'm just speaking for myself. Maybe I'm not a spiritual, but when I do that, it brings frustration. Yeah. It brings anger. It makes me mad. It makes me like a time. I mean, I'm, I'm ready. My, my kids can do something little. I'm ready to bark at them. They didn't even do nothing wrong. I come, I come home after work because I've been meditating on some wrong things. I come home after work. I just change the whole mood of the house. The dog hides from me. My kids hide from me. The kitty cat won't even come over and let me pet her. You know what I'm saying? Because what? I'm not renewing my mind with the things of God. Hey, again, the word of God has not changed. Nothing's different. Nothing's different. God's still on the throne. He's still true. He's still watching over his word, word to perform it in your life. Now listen to this. It says, don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's so good. Look what's going on. You know what? If we really were God-minded right now, this right now is one of the greatest opportunities to show people who Jesus is. Yeah. This right now, the harvest is, re oh my goodness, we're going to talk about that later. I'm telling you, if we look at it from a different perspective, you know what I mean? Look up, be alert on what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. See things from his perspective. Friends, let me tell you something. When we walk out this righteous life, it's time for us to start seeing things from his perspective. It's time for us to start seeing things based off of his word. Because I'm telling you what, if you try to figure out everything going on in your little mind, maybe you have a bigger mind than me. But I'm telling you, if you try to do it, let me tell you something. All it's going to do is bring frustration because you within yourself, you're smart. I'm not saying you're not smart. You're smart. But you within yourself is not going to be able to figure this out. Right. You know what I mean? You're not. But when you focus on the author and finisher of your faith, when you focus on Jesus, it's amazing how he will start changing your perspective. So I'm in the seat of righteousness. I've been made the righteous of God in Christ. But now there is a walk I'm supposed to take. One effort in that walk when I look at Colossians 3, I see that it's time for us to be God-minded. Let me tell you something, friends. I don't know about you, but people used to play the fence. We had so-called Christians jumping back and forth, kind of world things, Jesus things, world things, Jesus things. Let me tell you something. I've been saying this for the last three years, last four years maybe. We can't play that game anymore. You've got to pick teams. You can't wear jerseys of both teams. I'm telling you, you can't wear jerseys of both teams anymore. You've got to pick sides. You got, he says, it's time for us to get serious. You want to walk this righteous life that I am giving you, that I'm equipping you with, that I've called you to walk. He's saying, it is time for you to get serious with the things of God and walk out this life I've given you. Amen. Amen. It's time for us to be God-minded. Then, then we move on and we look at verses 5 to 11. Now, this is something that should change you because so many times in our Christian circles, we have taken the grace message and we've diluted it to meet where are, we're at in our life. I'm just going to be honest with you. We've diluted the grace message to me, whatever's going on with our life. Well, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to talk this way. I'm going to act this way. But thank God for your grace. You know what I mean? Get a little jig going on it. Thank God for your grace. That's not what he's called you to do. See, now listen, grace isn't only 
his forgiveness. It's an empowerment and it's an equipping he's given each one of us to be able to walk out the life he's called you to walk. Amen. It's an empowerment he's given you. Yes. Why don't I have to live in sin all the time? Because you've been empowered by his grace to walk out that. Amen. Why don't I have to live defeated all the time? Because you've been called and anointed and equipped in his grace. And parents, let me tell you something. If you have a kiddo, you've been graced and you've been equipped to walk and to raise that, that kid in the ways of the Lord. Amen. You've been called. You want to say, what's my calling? Baby, let me tell you something. You know it right in front of you every single day. That's your calling. Amen. You've been anointed and you've been equipped to pass the heritage of faith onto the next generation. Amen. Amen. You've been called that you expect him to go higher, soar greater with the things of God. Amen. But so when we look in verse 5 through 11, it's so wonderful because he talked. Now, now listen to this. He talks about taking off some things of our past. Amen. He talks. He's saying that you are called. Amen. Thank you. He's saying that you. Thank you, brother. He's saying that you are called to take off some things in the past. Amen. See, see, it's not you are called to do it. You are empowered to do it. This is important. And then when we look in verses 12 to 14, he talks about we've taken off some stuff. Now it's time for us to put some stuff on. Amen. Now this is important. This is important because it is a decision. Now here, here's what I'm saying. Well, let, let's talk about taking off and putting on. When I got ready today, I didn't wake up, stand up, and this shirt, this beautiful shirt just flew right on me. It didn't happen. I didn't go, and it just <laughs> right on me. I know that sounds crazy, but listen, that's what we think so many times with the things of God. It just happens. It just happens. He's like our little genie. We just look, 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 and yeah, it happens. You know what I mean? No. See, I had to make a decision this morning. When I got up, I had to make a decision to put this on. And now I had to make a decision with the understanding that when I put this on, it wasn't only for me, but you were going to see what I was wearing. Now listen to what I'm talking about. There's some things in your life that you need to be taken off. And there's some things in your life that you need to be putting on. And the Word of God shows us clearly here that as a believer, there's some things we must put on. And see, when I put something on, it's a daily decision I make every single day to what I'm going to put on. I think sometimes we just say, oh, Lord, give me love. We just go about our day, act the way we want, do what we want. Why am I not loving anybody? Because it's a decision, my friend, you have to put on every single day. Yeah. It's a decision. And when you make that decision every single day, whether you feel like it or not, whether you make that decision every single day, whether you feel like it or not, it's not only something for you, but it's going to be evident to other people. Yeah. See, there are things in this word that God has said, we looked at it earlier, that God said it's time for us to begin putting on. It's a decision we have to make. The Bible says we are to clothe ourselves with these. And it all starts with love. We ought, to be, we ought to be the most loving bunch, the kind, the gentle. You know, unfortunately, man, I'll talk to you for a minute. I can't find anywhere in the Word of God where it says, let your toughness be evident to all. I like that because everybody wants to be tough. You know what I mean? I'm not really. I can just run faster than everybody. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but everybody says, let your, let your joking be evident to all. Let your coolness like thorns be evident to all. You know, let your craziness be evident to all. It doesn't say, I'm not saying any of that stuff's wrong. That's not what I'm getting. But when I read the word of God for you, it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. You know that? When we look here again, it says we are to clothe ourselves with gentleness. We are to clothe ourselves. That binds it all together with love. What I'm trying to say is this, my friend. Sometimes we've been pursuing the wrong thing all of our life. We've been, pursue, we've been pursuing to be the toughest, the meanest, the funniest, the this. And God says, no, you need to be pursuing gentleness. You need to be pursuing love. That's what you need to be pursuing in your life. And it says that's a decision. I, I think that's fascinating because, you know, when we were saved, 
the seed of the Word of God has been planted in our heart. The seed of love, the seed of joy, the fruit of the Spirit has been planted in our heart. I told this again, and I love this. One of my favorite sermons or messages, if, if you said, hey, Chad, give me the five best messages you ever, you ever heard in your life. One of them I would give you is called The Love Walk by Brother or by Kenneth E. Hagan. One of the greatest, you probably heard this message many, many times from him. But he said in and he said, um, he was sitting around a um, group of Pentecostal pastors after dinner one, after a service, they were at a dinner. And several of them were getting kind of, they were, they were like, you know what we need to have? We need to have a love movement. We need to have a love movement. We need to have a love movement, you know, just love. And they said, and he said, he just stayed quiet. They said, we need to have a love movement. And they said, Brother Hagen, what do you think? He says, I think y'all need to get saved. They said, what? We all need to get saved. He goes, love of, shed, love of God's been shed abroad in your heart. You don't have to pray for it. You just have to walk in it, amen? amen. I said, that was so powerful. We've been busy praying, praying, praying for love, and that seed's been planted in your heart. And through staying connected to the vine, that's what has been given. See, every born-again believer, that seed of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control has been planted inside the heart of every born-again believer. Every one of us. Those seeds. Men, you cannot say you can't be gentle. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You've been given the seed, and when you were born again, you've been given the seed of love in your heart. You've been given those, you've been, that's been planted inside of you. The reason why you can't be gentle is you never walked in the realities of it in your life. You never let that grow. You never let that grow in your life. So when the Word of God declares us, gives us an assignment that we are to clothe ourselves with love. We are to clothe ourselves with gentleness. We are to clothe ourselves with compassion. We just read it. That means there is an expectation of you to live it in your life. And see, the good thing about God, He doesn't ask us to do anything. He hasn't given us the ability to walk in. Amen? He's given us His love to love people with. That ought to excite somebody. He said, clothe your... Because here's why. This world doesn't need another sermon. This world needs love. This world needs joy, needs peace, needs patience, needs kindness, needs goodness, needs gentleness, needs self-control. That's what this world needs. But unless we walk in the realities of the relation of, unless we walk in the realities of our righteousness that we've been given, unless we walk in those realities, this world will continually miss out on love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Why is that? Because that's the fruit that's supposed to be coming out of your lives. That's the fruit that every born-again believer is expected to walk out. That's the fruit that's supposed to be, because here's what this world's needing right now. I said earlier, they don't need another sermon. What they're needing is be able to come and see your life and pick off a piece of that fruit to nourish their life. Amen. They're needing to see you at your work. They're needing to be able to pick off. You know what? The, you walk into a room and everybody's upset, but that fruit of peace is dangling off your life. Woo! They can come and they can... Take that piece of fruit off your life and they can nourish their life. And I, I know one thing about that. There's a beautiful fruit tree in your yard and the fruit look beautiful. The fruit's attractive. Oh, this is so good. The fruit's attractive. Guess what? You're going to go to it not only once, but you're going to keep coming back. And if it's real good, you're going to bring your friends with you. You're going to bring your friends with you. What am I saying? Because when we live out the fruit, God has equipped us to live out. This world can see. So when you make a decision every day that I'm taking off the old, that I'm getting rid of the old, and I'm putting on what God has called me to put on, now you're walking in the righteousness that God has called you to walk in. And then when we look down again in verse 15 through 17, you start seeing where there's an expectation of every believer to be led by the Spirit of God. And now this is important, I'm telling you. People say, how do I solve a lot of problems in my life? Keith Moore, one of my instructors, you could, probably a lot of people know him, great minister, great instructor. I remember at Raymond Bible College, he said the answer to a million and one questions is be led. He said the answer to most of your issues is be led. And I always like saying this, when you see in, in the word here, it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. I just looked this up again in the Amplified right before this service. And the word rule in your heart means act 
as the umpire in your life. Basically, act as the decision maker for your life. I always tell people this. People say, oh, being led by the Spirit, man, that's far out there. You got to be really spiritual to be led. Stop, stop, stop. There's a lot of ways you can be led by the Spirit, but there's two main ways that you can start doing this moment as you walk out the door. Number one, you be led by the Spirit through the Word of God. As you read and study the Word of God, you may say, why am I reading this? Let me tell you something. When you get this down in your spirit, man, when decisions happen in your life, the Word of God will come out of your life. You will make decisions based off of the Word, the seed of the Word of God that you have planted in your heart. You will make good decisions based off that. That's the number one way every born-again believer should be led by the Spirit of God. See, let me tell you something. The devil, if he could kill you, he would have done it. But, once he, but what he wants to do, he wants to keep you ignorant. He wants to keep this book away from you. He wants to keep this book away from you because if you, if a believer, ooh, if a believer gets this word inside of them, they will become an explosive force for the kingdom of God. And let me tell you something. If you want to, if you want to guide your family correctly, if you want to run your business correctly, if you want to make the correct decisions, you got to get this word planted in your heart. Because when you get this word, it's amazing. When you get this word planted in your heart, the number one way to be led by the Spirit of God, decisions when you make, the word of God will come up. Somebody will be saying, hey, we ought to do this, but something will come. No, that's not integrity. You can't do that. Well, where did that come from? The word of God's been planted in your heart. See, we, we, our, our level's not, our level's a whole nother level. Morality decisions. Morality decisions is not based on what society's saying. When you get this word in your heart, it's easy to make morality decisions. You see what I'm saying? Whatever the decision is, number one way to be led by the Spirit of God. Number two, n- another great way to be led by the Spirit of God, you can practice and don't overthink this, but another way you can be led by the Spirit of God is through peace. Through peace. The Word of God declares, let peace be the umpire of your life. Peace ought to be the decision maker. If you're not in peace, stop. I always say this, if you feel, uh, stop. If you feel, ah, uh, go. People say, well, that's really immature, but that's, uh, you all know what I'm talking about. We try to overthink the things of God. The things of God is not difficult. He's not hiding his, he's not hiding his, the reality of himself from you. He wants you to be led. He expects you to be led. He said, my sheep will know my voice and a voice of a stranger they will not follow. He wants you to be led. He said, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. He expects you to be led. One of the greatest ways you can also be led is through the inner voice, through peace. Follow peace. Let that guide you. Well, this deal looks great. This new job looks great. This promotion looks great. But every time I think about it, I get a uh, on the inside. The Holy Spirit's leading you. It's greater than him coming out of the skies with all the angels to tell you and reveal you something. He's leading you. And you know one great thing about the Holy Spirit? He can lead me on a totally different situation and he can be leading you on the same time on a different situation. He can be leading you on a different situation. He can be leading you on a different situation. That'll meet every one of your needs. Amen? Another way. So the Bible says, so we look here on a, on a lifestyle of a believer, on living in that righteousness. It says in verse 15 through 17 to be led. And now we, we got some amens on this next section. But verses 18 through 21 is very important. It says, now that I become God-minded, now that I'm taking off the old and I'm putting on the new, now that I'm being led by the Spirit of God, it's time for me to get my house in order. Not only my house in order, then as we go on through verses 20 through to 25, it says, not only my house in order, now I'm getting my life in order. Amen. Now I'm getting my life in order. Let me tell you something. One of the greatest, you can have heaven on earth when you get your house in order. And one of the greatest messages you can ever preach your children is by them seeing your life and imitating your life. Boy, I can give you story after story after story after story on this. It says, it says here that wives submit to yourself to your husband. I always found out this in my own life. My wife had never has a problem submitting herself to her husband when I show her who Jesus is every single day. You know, I don't remember my wife ever saying, oh, Chad, your muscles are so big. Maybe because they're not. But she, I don't remember her saying that. Or she said, oh, you're so clever. You're so smart. But you know what I remember her saying all the time to me when it happens? She said, boy, you're so sweet to me today. Thank you. You're so nice to me today. I'm serious. Those are the things that, that stand out to her. Boy, you're so nice. The way you talked to the kids today were so sweet. Thank you. That's the thing. She don't have an issue with me leading When I'm showing her who Jesus is, it's fun to follow Jesus when he's good. Wife won't have any issues when you show her who Jesus is. 
And then I love this part about the kids. There's one commandment in the Word of God. And I've said this many, many times. There's one commandment in the Word of God given to kids. And it's obey your parents. Honor your father and mother, because here's why. Listen to me. Don't ever think it's okay for your kids not to honor their parents. I don't care if your kid is now 45, 15, 10, whatever it is. Listen to me. I don't care if you disagree with how your parents are living. You can still honor them. And here's why. Here's why that message is in there. Because if you learn how to honor your parents as you grow older, you'll never have an issue with honoring God. Now for younger kids, see, parents, listen, for your younger kids, you ought to show your kids every day who God is. Because as they grow and get out of the house, if you show them who really God is by the way you live, by the way you talk, by the way you love, by clothing yourselves in this thing, when they go out and live on their own, have to make decisions on their own, do things on their own, they won't ever have any issues because they won't have an issue honoring God because they've honored their parents. And then one of the greatest examples as a believer, when we look at the end, our life in order, he really talks about in here about at your place, at your place of influence, at your job. Everything you do, you ought to leave this place today saying, everything I do, I'm going to do it to honor God. I don't care if I'm cleaning, the, scrubbing the dishes or I'm making the biggest business decision in the world or whatever it is. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for my King God. I'm doing it for God because when you do it for God, you do it for excellence. And one of the greatest examples, I've heard stories after stories from even young um, college age kids said, I, I started this, this one told me recently, he said, I started this new job. And he said, it was amazing. The, the boss said, hey, can you work this weekend? And, and the boy told me, he said, all I said to him was, yeah, no problem. That sounds great. And they said, oh my goodness. Wow, thank you so much. Nobody ever talks to us like that. Why? He said, nobody ever talks to us like that anymore. Usually they get mad, roll their eyes. He, go, he looked at me, he goes, all I said was, yeah, sure, no problem, that sounds good. Showing off Jesus again. Yeah. Showing off Jesus again. Yeah. The influence of that. Anything you do, anything you do, anything you do, you represent Jesus. So here's what I'm trying to say out of all this. We are equipped to walk in this righteous lifestyle. We are called to do this. And he says this, hey, First thing what you need to do is get serious about your relationship with Jesus. I'm telling everybody today, it's time for every single one of us to get serious about your relationship with Jesus. He says, not only that, it's time for us. There's been some things, listen to me, friends. There's been some things that's been hindering you. There's been some things that's been hurting you from fulfilling the potential you know God has put in your heart. And it's time for us, get rid of that stuff. Don't keep those old clothes, throw them away. You don't need them anymore. They don't even fit you anymore anyway. No, I'm kidding. It's time for us to get rid of that stuff. And it's time for us, God says, to clothe ourselves. Clothe ourselves with him. It's a decision, a daily decision you're going to have to make every day. It's a daily lifestyle you're going to have to live whether you feel like it or not, whether you want to or not. It's a daily decision you've got to make every day to clothe yourself. And now not only that, it's time for us to start being led by the Spirit of God. Because there's some people God needs you to speak life to. There's some people he needs to connect you with. There's some people he needs, he needs to help. He needs to get you with so you can show them who Jesus is. You need to be led. Amen. You need to be led. He's got a plan for you. You've got to be led to fulfill the plan he's got for you. Amen. Not only that, it's time for us as believers to get our house in order and our life in order. Because when we do, we'll become an explosive force for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. When we do, we will be equipped, we'll be ready, and we'll be prepared to do what God has called us to do. And I'm here to tell you something right now. These times, if you're focusing on the news, if you're focusing on media, if you're, if you're just sitting around the office listening to everybody else's opinion that don't know anything about anything, if you're doing that, let me tell you something. It's going to bring frustration. It's going to make you mad. It's going to upset you. It'll put you in fear. It'll put you in worry. It'll put you in places you don't need to go. Amen. And let me tell you something. That's not true. This is the time. Now listen to me. This is the place. God is preparing. Listen to me. I'm speaking this right from the throne. God is preparing an end time harvest like we, are not even, we don't even understand is going to happen. 
I believe there is going to be an awakening of the things of God like never before. There is going to be an end time harvest like never before. And I'm going to tell you something else. You do not be afraid. You do not be worried because he's coming back for a glorious bride. He's coming back for a beautiful bride. He's not coming back for his kids hiding, his kids afraid, his kids in fear. No, he's coming back for a glorious church. And, when, and before there's ever judgment, there, before there's ever judgment, there's always mercy. Listen to me. Look, at, look, search the Bible for yourself. Before there's ever great judgment, there's great mercy. And I believe with all my heart there's going to be an awakening of Jesus like never before. And he needs every single believer to be equipped and to be ready with their life in order, with their family in order, with being God-minded because he's going to call you and he's equipped you to help bring in that harvest. We're going to be some farmers, you know what I'm saying? He's going to call us to bring in that harvest. He's going to call us to bring in that harvest harvest to bring many 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 people and show them who God is some of those people you'll bring in you'll never say a word to them but they'll see the life you live they'll see the life you live and they'll say man I'm going to be like that guy I want to I want to pick that fruit of love joy peace patience off that guy's life I'm going to be like and I'm going to bring everybody with me because I'm telling you why there get ready there is going to be an awakening like we've never seen Amen. and there's going to be many many people coming to know who Jesus is amen this is our time. This is the place. We're not here by accident. He has called you and I as believers to be equipped and to get prepared because we're going to be ready. As we stay God-minded, he's going to lead you and he's going to give you opportunities to show people who he really is. Amen. He's calling you. He's calling you. You have been called. You have been equipped and you've been given everything you need to fulfill God's plan for your life. Amen? Amen. If you believe with me right now, go ahead and stand up. Lord, we thank you and we love you, sir. We thank you. You have called us. We thank you. You have equipped us. We thank you. We are anointed. We are ready and we are prepared to do what you have called us to do. Lord, as we look through here and we see in, in Colossians, we see Colossians 3 Christian. That's us. Lord, as we become God-minded, God-centered, God-focused. Lord, you will lead us and you will guide us. Lord, this is the time. This is the place. You are so good. Your mercies are new every morning. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Lord, I say this for everybody. Forgive us. If we've been thinking defeat, if we've been walking in defeat, if we've been living frustrated and furious, if we've been living in fear, that's not you, that's not your ways, and Lord, we are your kids. Lord, forgive us. We know you paid the ultimate sacrifice when you hung on the cross for us, that we can live a full, healthy, happy, wholesome life. And Lord, we prepare our hearts to clothe ourselves every day with love with joy, with peace, because that's what this world needs. And we are here. We are ambassadors of you, Lord. We are here to show people the realities of you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Lord, I ask you to stir every person's heart in this room today. I ask you to stir them. Lord, I thank you. There's a fire burning and growing inside of them that cannot be put out fire that shot up in their bones, a fire to know you more, a fire to seek your face greater, a fire to hunger for you in greater ways like they never experienced. We love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You know, sometimes in life when you're on a frontline battle, you think about an army, man. When he's in the front lines in a battle, he's probably not thinking about what's for dinner. He's probably not thinking about, I hope I get in on the card game later. He's probably not thinking about, oh, do my clothes look nice? No, he has tunnel vision. He is focused on the task at hand. I think sometimes you need to realize when you catch yourself in a battle, you may be in a different battle than just what's going on. You may be in your own battle. 
Sometimes it's time for you to step away from distractions, if you know what I'm saying. Step away from distractions. You may have to turn off the, the TV. You may have to stop hanging so much around at the break room with guys when they're giving their opinions. You may have to put down the newspaper for a few weeks. And you may have to start getting some tunnel vision for what you're believing for. See, when those army men are on the front line, they got vision to conquer what's ahead of them. And any kind of distractions will hinder them of fulfilling what their target is. Sometimes I think in our spiritual battles, we get so busy with distractions, it hurts us from obtaining what God has for us, amen? So I challenge every one of that in Jesus' name. Now, as we close the day, if you need prayer about anything going on in your life, you say, you know what, this righteous life you talked about is amazing, but I don't even know what you're talking about. We have some prayer team workers that are going to be up front here in just a moment. And if you want to pray about anything, you got something going on in your life, I always say this, I don't care if you have a toe ache to a headache. God will meet your needs, amen? If you got any situations going on in your life and you need prayer at the end of service, come up front and we'll pray with you. God's on the throne, amen? We can rejoice. You know, there's two meters, there's two uh, meters you ought, to be, you ought to be looking at every day in your life. And that's your joy meter and that's your peace meter. Don't try to sec, don't try to outsmart yourself. It's real simple. How's your joy and how's your peace? If those are if those are running on empty, if you know what I mean, get them filled back up again. Don't don't try to say, well, you don't know what's going on. Stop it. How's your joy meter? How's your peace meter? The devil wants to steal your joy and he wants to steal your peace. Because if he's got those two things, he's got you. Don't don't give it up. Don't give it up. Don't give it up, amen. Let's pray in closing. Father God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for the word today. We thank you we're not a return void, that it will accomplish what it's set out to do. Father, I thank you for everybody in this room, Lord. I thank you that we are walking in your ways. We're walking in our realities of you. Lord, send people to us. That's our cry. Send people to us. Send broken people to us. Send hurt people to us. Send people that don't know where to go to us because we're ready, we're equipped, and we're called to show them who you are. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We thank you for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Be blessed. God bless you, everybody.